Shana Haba'a Be Yerushalayim Next year in Jerusalem Over there, over there in the Welcome to Theology in Perspective The Bible Teaching Ministry of Dr. Daniel Woodhead Welcome to Theology in Perspective. I'm Daniel Woodhead, and I'm blessed that you could join me again today as we study together the book of Revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ. We're nearing the end of the tribulation, and as we've seen in our last session, the last two bold judgments talk about the great tribulation coming to an end with the campaign of Armageddon. And I initiated our campaign <laughs> um, uh, with the uh, first stage of the armies of the Antichrist coming together, just gathering, gathering. Now, they're not going to battle in the Valley of Megiddo. They're commonly called Armageddon. But uh, <clears throat> it's, it's where they gather to get ready. I'm going to read Joel 3, verse 9 for you, which says, Proclaim ye this among the nations. Prepare war. Stir up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up and beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks unto spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. Haste ye, and come, all ye nations round about, and gather yourselves together. Thither shall cause the mighty ones to come down, O Jehovah. Now God here is mocking them by telling them to go ahead and manufacture weapons. Go ahead. For the weak, he says, <clears throat> for the weak, he says, go ahead and persuade yourselves that you're strong. <laughs> because while Satan and the Antichrist prepare the forces for the purpose of destroying the Jews, God has an entirely different purpose for allowing this gathering. Psalm 2, verse 1 says, and 2 and 3 even say, Why do the nations rage and the peoples mediate a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together saith Jehovah, against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bonds asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens will laugh. The Lord will have them in derision. And then verse 5 and 6 say, Then will he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet I have set my king upon the holy hill of Zion. So this just demonstrates that the taunting of the nations gathered together to do harm to God the Father and Jesus Christ, <laughs> they think they're going to really prevail here. Satan is also seen seeking to destroy God's Jews and break the cords of God's control in the world. You know, God is seen as sitting in heaven laughing at this folly. God it will be established, and in his first stage of the campaign of Armageddon, as the armies gather for their next move. So we've established that. Right? They're gathering in the Valley of Jezreel, okay, just like the Allies gathered in England to prepare for D Day of June the 6th in 1944, where they came across the Channel and then they moved into Normandy, France. But that's not where they gathered. They gathered in England. So here they're gathering in the Valley of Jezreel, they're getting ready. Now, I want to look at the next stage here, which is the destruction of Babylon, and just introduce this topic because it is quite complex. Ancient Babylon is going to be rebuilt, and it's going to become the Antichrist political and economical capital of his worldwide empire. Remember now, Jerusalem is the ecclesiastical capital, 
where the false prophet is. But that's not where the economic and the political capital are. It, it, that that's, that uh, <clears throat> is not to be confused also with the temporary battle camp that's stated in Daniel 1145. No, this is the headquarters of the one world government. In Daniel 11.45, it states that the Antichrist is going to plant his headquarters during the mid-tribulation war, just before he's killed, and then he's brought back to life by Satan himself. And this is known as the Second Worldwide Conflict. It's fully described in Daniel 11, verses 40 to 45. And uh, a more accurate translation of that would be, he shall plant the tents of his palace between the seas at the glorious holy mountain. And the word for tent there just refers to like a military tent of a general. And the word for palace is like a royal tent. It's a royal tent of a military general. That's the Antichrist. And it's set up. It's set up between the seas, meaning between the Mediterranean Sea on the east and the Dead Sea, or on the west and the Dead Sea, Salt Sea, if you will, on on the east. Furthermore, it's at the glorious holy mountain, meaning the Temple Mount, or Mount Moriah, Mount Zion, the Temple Mount. So, I want to introduce this concept of Babylon. We've looked at this in previous lessons, lessons, but it's helpful to understand this concept because it has three different kinds of references in the Bible. Now, the Bible contains eight chapters that deal with the concept of Babylon. It's Genesis 10 and 11. Isaiah 13 and 14, Jeremiah 50 and 51, and finally Revelation 17 and 18. Each of these chapters plays a role in the origin and the identification and the destiny also of Babylon. If you read through all of these chapters in one sequence, you can get this perspective that God has on this important concept. But because of the nature of the Hebrew language, not all the information in the Old Testament chapters pertain to Babylon. So, you got Babylon, the concept is found in three different categories. A concept now, it's a physical location, it's a city, it's a way of life. The Babylonian way of life is the world's system, and it's also... Uh, corruption of the world systems, specifically the ecclesiastical entities. The occult, the occult comes out of this. Genesis chapters 10 and 11 describe its origin in terms of its physical location, world systems, founder, and corruption. Genesis 10, 8 starts with, And Cush begot Nimrod. And he began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And in the beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Erech and Akkad and Kalna in the land of Shinar. So the word before here uh, is pane in Hebrew. And it means defiant. So he was defiant against God. So Nimrod, his name means to rebel or to be rebellious. Josephus, the first century Jewish historian, says, Now it was Nimrod who excited them to such an affront and contempt of God. He was the grandson of Ham. That's the biblical text. Does not name his father. Uh, he's the son of Noah, a bold man and of great strength of hand. He persuaded them not to ascribe satisfaction to God, uh, as if it was through his means they were happy, but to believe that it was their own courage which procured that happiness. He also gradually changed the government into tyranny, seeking no other way of turning men from the fear of God, but to bring them into a constant dependence on his power. The Tower of Babel was, in essence, an attempt to have their own way apart from God. Now, they were commanded to be fruitful and fill the earth. Instead, what did they do? They attempted to settle down in one location and 
<laughs> and, 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 and just establish a world state to offset the divine rule. The tower was meant to be a rebellious attempt to break from divine rule. They did not wish to obey God. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the cultic background of Babylon. Tradition suggests that Nimrod died a violent death. Now, one tradition says a wild animal killed him. Another says that Shem uh, killed him because he had led the people into the worship of the Baals. And according to ancient Egyptian and Babylonian traditions, his mother was one named Semiramis. Now, Semiramis is sometimes referred to as his wife or his mother. And this leads to the belief that Nimrod married his mother. And according to these traditions, Semiramis rose to greatness because of her son. And she was presented with great difficulty when her son died. So instead, she pronounced him to be a god so that she herself would become a goddess. Now, even though Semiramis claimed to be a virgin, she had another son called Tammuz, who she said was the reincarnation of Nimrod. She became known as the Virgin Mother, the Holy Mother, and the Queen of Heaven, and she was symbolized by the moon. So began the worship of Semiramis and the child god and the whole paraphernalia with the Babylonian religious system. After the decline of Babylon, this religion, now it doesn't matter whether these things are true or not, genuine. What, it, what matters is they were believed, they were adhered to, and they were promulgated. That's the truth of it. Whether it's actually factual that there was a Semiramis, uh, we don't know. But it doesn't matter because even the Bible in the book of Ezekiel says that she's been, uh, her son Tammuz has been worshipped, which is a cultic. So after the decline of Babylon, the religion left through migration of Babylonians. They got out of there and they went to Egypt and the people there worshipped Isis and her son Osiris. So instead of Semiramis and Tammuz, it's Isis and Osiris. Now the same mother and child deity appeared in Greece as Ceres, the great mother, with the babe as her breast, or, or Irene, the goddess of peace, with the boy Plutus in her arms. Now in pagan Rome, pagan Rome, this was Fortuna and Jupiter. Other cultures embrace the same concept. Uh, Cyprus and in India, uh, in its organized form, false religion began at the Tower of Babel and Nimrod, from which Babylon gets its name. Cain, Cain now was the first false worshiper, and many individuals after him followed his example. But organized pagan religion began with the descendants of Ham. He was one of Noah's three sons. Now, they decided under Nimrod to, 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 to erect this great monument that was going to reach to heaven and make themselves a great name. So, under the leadership of the proud and apostate Nimrod, they planned to storm heaven and unify their power and prestige in a great worldwide system of worship. That was man's first counterfeit religion from which every other false religion in one way or another sprang. God's judgment frustrated their primary purpose of making a grand demonstration of humanistic unity. So God confuses their language so that they could not understand one another's speech, and he scattered them abroad from there over the whole face of the earth. So the Lord halted the building of that tower, and he fractured their solidarity, broke them apart. But those people took with them the seeds of that false, idolatrous religion. They didn't give this up. 
And they and their descendants have been planning this around the world ever since. Now, the ideas and the forms were altered, adapted, and sometimes more sophisticated or less sophisticated, but the basic system remains and it's unchanged. That's why Babel or Babylon is called the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. It's from Revelation 17, 5. She was the progenitor of all false religions. From various ancient sources, it seems like Nimrod's wife, mother, Semiramis, apparently was a high priestess of the Babylonian religion and the founder of all mysterious religions. So, after the tower was destroyed and all the new languages were given by God, she was worshipped as a goddess under a whole bunch of different names. She, came, she became Ishtar of Syria, Astarte of Phoenicia, and Isis of Egypt, Aphrodite of Greece, and Venus of Rome. Each one of these, in each one of these cases, She's a deity of sexual love and fertility. Her son, Tammuz, also became deified under a whole bunch of different names and was the consort of Ishtar and the god of the underworld. Now, according to this cult of Ishtar, Tammuz was conceived by a sunbeam. He was the counterfeit virg uh, uh, version here of, of, of Jesus' virgin birth. Tammuz corresponded to Baal in Phoenicia, Osiris in Egypt, and Eros in Greece, and Cupid in Rome. In every case, the worship of those gods and goddesses were associated with sexual immorality. The celebration of Lent which has no basis in scripture, but rather developed from the pagan celebration of Semiramis, mourning for 40 days over the death of Tammuz. Now, before his alleged resurrection is another one of uh, Satan's mythical counterfeits. Look, look, look here. In, 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 in Ezekiel 13 excuse me, 8, 13, 14, and uh, 15, God is showing Ezekiel what is going on at the temple in Jerusalem. Ezekiel's been carted off to Babylon, 597 B.C. And between then and 586, when the Babylonians finally broke through and ruined the city, he was warning God was warning Ezekiel to tell people, tell people what's going on over there. And he says, Turn ye yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations that they do. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north, and behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. And he said unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Turn it yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations than these. So Ezekiel is communing with the Lord in a vision, and the Lord showed him these things. The Babylonians took Ezekiel to Babylon again, you know, <clears throat> uh, sometime, uh, like 597, 598 B.C., and this is what God is showing him. Now, we're going to further develop the concept of Babylon um, because the text here develops the concept of Nimrod being against the Lord, and it's confirmed in uh, several uh, Jewish writings, not just in our, our Bible, the book of Genesis. The Targum of uh, Jonathan describes Nimrod to be the mightiest rebel against the Lord that ever was on the earth. The Jerusalem Targum reads it that he was mighty in sin before the Lord and a hunter of men, exhorting them to leave the judgments of Shem and adhere to the judgments of Nimrod. Remember, Shem was the good son of Noah. The good son is the firstborn, and that's the line through which the Lord Jesus came. And he wanted, uh, <clears throat> he was fighting, fighting this process. 
Nimrod founded a system of government which was apart from God and set men to worship the sun, the moon, and the stars. Uh, Targum is just a Jewish writing, similar to a commentary of the first century A.D., which explained the Hebrew text of the Old Testament in, a, in an era when Hebrew was declining as a spoken language. So unenlightened humans did not gradually develop idolatry. It came about generation, two generations, excuse me, after Noah's son left the ark. Idolatry rose suddenly under Nimrod, the great-grandson of Noah. He brought it into being to counteract the will and the worship of the true God. He resisted, he rebelled, he hated God. You know, this is deification of humans, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life instead of the true creator. Now the third part of this idea of Babylon is their commerce. In and of itself, these concepts are not bad, but this is what they worshipped instead of God. For nearly 2,000 years, Babylon was one of the most important cities in the world. It was a commercial and financial center in Mesopotamia, the arts of divination, astronomy, astrology, accounting, mathematics, and um, private and commercial law sprang up from Babylon. So many of our world systems came from that religion, from, from that region, and that religion too. <laughs> Herodotus, the Greek father of history, he claimed that the outer walls were 56 miles in length, 80 feet thick and 320 feet high. He said that they were wide enough to allow a four-horse chariot to turn around on. The river Euphrates ran through the middle of the city under the walls and were linked with a moat surrounding the walls. Inside the walls were fortresses and temples containing immense statues of solid gold. And rising above the city was the famous Tower of Babel. And that was a temple to the god Marduk that seemed to reach to the heavens. Nebuchadnezzar came from the sea lands of the tribe of Kedar in the south, which would be Kuwait. Mohammed supposedly did, and so did the um, last uh, leader, Saddam Hussein of, uh, of Iraq. Now, Nebuchadnezzar also built the Ishtar Gate. It was a double gate at the south end of the processional way, and that was dedicated to the goddess Ishtar. It was covered with brilliant blue grays, blicks, and, and, and it, it had these bas-relief animal sculptures. It now sits in the State Museum of Berlin. Nebuchadnezzar paved the street sidewalks with small red stone slabs, and along the edge of each stone it said, I am Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, who made this. It was, it was just demonstrating his complete and absolute power over Babylon. The Babylonians divided the day into 24 hours, and each hour into 60 minutes, and each minute 60 seconds. This form of counting, it's called hexagesimal, or base 60, it survived for 4,000 years. Their year and calendar had 30-month days and 360-day years. Same as Genesis 7 and 8, Daniel 7, Revelation 12 and 14, and, and, and Revelation 13. So, so um, they had tables of square, square roots, cubes, cube roots, reciprocals, exponential functions, and log functions. They had a knowledge of trigonometry long before the Greeks, and they knew the Pythagorean theorem 1,200 years before Pythagoras did. And they had pi. They divided the circle into 360 degrees. Now, these are known concepts in math today, but they go back to the Babylonians. They developed them. Babylon spiritually symbolized the city of man or the city of Satan. It's never been destroyed yet. It fell into disrepair over the years since Cyrus 
the Mede took over the city under Saddam Hussein. It was partially rebuilt, but God's going to destroy it. God is going to destroy it. I want to close with a short discussion here of the two women. The book of Revelation describes two women who are mothers that represent God's chosen people and the Babylonian system from Nimrod to the present age. It's important to demonstrate the contrast between these two so you can see how God characterizes his chosen in true faith in the abomination of idolatry that he's about to overthrow with the destruction of Babylon and the Babylonian system. Now, the first woman is called the woman clothed with the sun, the moon, and the stars, and she's presented in chapter 12 of Revelation, representing the nation Israel, or, or God's chosen. That's not to say that all Israel were true to him. I didn't say that. We know better than that. However, he chose them, and he gave them his oracles and his scripture, which is his oracles, and the Messiah he brought through them. The woman presented in the 17th chapter represents the Nimrod-initiated Babylonian system of corruption. Both are mothers. Both are mothers. The first brought forth a son who is the rule of the nations, Jesus. The second is the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. Now, both are splendidly dressed. The first, is, first one is clothed with the sun, and her clothing is made of light from heaven. The second is clothed in purple and scarlet and decked with gold, precious stones and pearls. All her ornaments are from below, either in the earth or in the sea. Both are very influential in their positions. The first has the moon, the empress of might, and the powers of darkness under her feet. The second has the rule of kingdoms and kings upon the earth. Both suffer. The first gets persecuted by the dragon, which is Satan, and tries to devour her child, Jesus. The second gets persecuted by ten kings who make her desolate and naked and eat her flesh and burn her with fire. Why, God, in his strength and judgment, gives her plagues. Both are very conspicuous and fill a lot of space in the history of the world. Both are counterparts of each other. One is a pure woman, the other is a harlot. The first is hated by the powers on the earth. The second is loved, flattered, and caressed by them. The first produces masculine nobility and is caught away to God and his throne. The second produces effeminate impurity which calls, calls down the fierceness of the divine wrath. The first is sustained and helped by celestial wings. The second is supported and carried by the beast with seven heads and ten horns. The first has a crown, a royal diadem. And the second has upon her head the forehead of the greatest destroyer and oppressor, of the holy people and is drunken with the blood of the prophets and the saints and upon all those that have been slain on the earth the first will give way to the new uh, new jerusalem and with heavenly splendor of restoring on earth the second gives way to the city of babylon that comes under the wrath of heaven it's a it gets destroyed and becomes a habitation of demons and unclean spirits these two women are set against each other as rivals, as rivals. And one is going to win and the other is not. Well, God bless you, and I'll pick this up in our next session. We hope you have been blessed by this message today on a contemporarily relevant Bible topic. Dr. Woodhead has been teaching the Bible for 25 years. He is a pastor an author, and conference speaker on various biblical subjects. Dr. Woodhead is the Dean of the Jewish Studies School at Schofield Seminary. His seminary teaching includes the Old Testament and Biblical Hebrew. He has attended Hebrew University in Jerusalem and a Hebrew College in Massachusetts. If you would like a DVD of today's program, 
please write us at Post Office Box 48, Hart, Michigan, 49420. Again, that's Post Office Box 48, Hart, Michigan, 49420. Or call us at 877 706 2479. That's 877 706 2479. Once again, 877 706 2479. The cost is $15. Let us know if you have any questions about today's broadcast. We look forward to providing you with continuing Bible messages each week on this station. God bless you. Take us there, take us there to the land of Zion. Next year in Jerusalem, the Shana Haba'a, the Yerushalayim. Next year in Jerusalem, O hear, O Israel, O Israel, hear. O Lord, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Next year, the Shana Haba'a, the Yerushalayim. Next year in Jerusalem. Over there, over there. 